So once again, good afternoon, Beijing, and good morning, Finland. Uh, my name is Juha Tuomin, and I'm the chairman of the Finnish Business Council, Beijing, and I'll be I'll be sort of moderating this um, webinar, Business Impact of the Coronavirus Part Two. Uh, today we will uh, we will first start off with an overview of the situation by Ambassador Garno Suriela. Then we will hear about the survey results of the coronavirus impact for Finnish businesses from uh, the Trade Commissioner from Business Finland, Chris Wang, followed followed by an uh, other overview on the situation from the banking uh, sector point of view. Chief Representative of SEP Bank, Peter Peter Wing Wanderos, Ling Wanderos, sorry about that, and then um, our Second company speaker will join us from Finland, Harri Roto, the CEO of Greenstream Network. And uh, finally, we will have a Q&A session moderated by Jaakko, uh, Jaakko Koivusaari, the second secretary uh, of trade and economy from the embassy of Finland. And uh, just a reminder for, for everyone, that uh, we have, again, the chat box open for questions. So please write your questions there and then uh, we will discuss them at the, at the end. But without further ado, let's, let's move on, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, thank you, Juha. Uh, first of all, welcome to this webinar also on my behalf. I hope everybody has been well in spite of these difficult times. There is indeed still a long road to go when it comes to the tackling this uh, pandemic. I hope you are all healthy and your business is getting back on track if it's not there already. Um, I will begin by saying a few words about the current situation here in China. Uh, the situation is, is indeed very difficult from our last, uh, uh, very different from our last seminar when still most of the coronavirus cases were found inside this country. Now the situation in China has gotten better and hotspots of the pandemic are elsewhere in the world. As you know, the number of cases has remained relatively small in China in the last weeks. In fact, um, recently most of the reported cases in China have been so-called imported cases meaning that the um, infected person has a uh, recent travel history abroad. According to the information by the Chinese Foreign Ministry, most of these cases are uh, Chinese citizens who have returned to China from abroad. This situation means that uh, China has increased its measures to tackle the imported cases. Uh, the borders are basically closed now and foreigners can't enter China. There are few exceptions to this rule, and for your information, there is still a possibility to apply for a Chinese visa for commercial reasons. But uh, this, uh, the details of this policy remain somewhat unclear and change quite often. The amount of lights um, has um, also been limited to minimum. Um, China allows now uh, one weekly flight from one country per one Chinese airline and foreign airlines can fly one weekly flight to China per one airline. Uh, what comes to Beijing, it is uh, at the uh, moment practically impossible to fly here directly from abroad because all flights are diverted to other cities in, in China. The quarantine rules uh, and different restrictions have not been eased in China. For example, Beijing requires all passengers from abroad as well as from other provinces to stay in quarantine for two weeks. In many places, uh, quarantine, needs, uh, quarantine needs to be done in designated location in quarantine centers. However, some provinces have already more uh, lenient policies and, for example, schools have been reopened in some provinces as in uh, Qinghai. The economy in China is uh, showing signs of getting back on track. 
most workers have been able to return to their workplaces, so the production has restarted. Logistics uh, networks and road transports um, are not yet back to normal, but the situation is getting better uh, all the time. However, the spread of the pandemic will continue to affect Chinese economy, as there is now a demand shock abroad. The export share of China's GDP is almost 20%, as you may know. I would like to say also a few words about the situation and measures in Finland. Um, there are about, uh, if we talk about the coronavirus situation, there are about 1,500 confirmed cases in, in Finland as we speak. More than 60 people are in intensive care and more, about 20 people have died. Most of the cases are found in Uusima region, which is the region surrounding Helsinki. This region is one of the uh, most densely populated region in Finland and has altogether more than 1.5 million inhabitants, about one third uh, of the entire population in our country. Almost three weeks ago, Finland declared a state of emergency due to the coronavirus epidemic. The government decided then at that point to take a number of measures in accordance uh, with the Emergency Powers Act slow down the spreading of the coronavirus and to protect the risk groups. Finland has uh, also restricted public gatherings. Schools have been closed almost everywhere and are using e-teaching methods now. There are limitations on people arriving from abroad as well. Foreign tourists are not able to enter Finland, but Finnish national nationals and foreign nationals with residence permits can return to their home in Finland. Issuing visas has been temporarily suspended at the Finnish embassies and consulates also here in China. One of the most uh, significant and strong measures was to impose uh, restrictions on moving to and from Uusimaa region. This means that basically people can't leave or get into Uusimaa. These restrictions do not apply to some uh, special cases, such as people who need to cross the border to get to their workplaces, as well as uh, uh, road uh, transportation, road free is free to move. The Finnish economy, of course, will be also uh, hit hard by the epidemic. For example, the service sector is partly at a standstill. At least more than uh, 300,000 employees are currently within a process called cooperation negotiations or in Finnish UT Neuvottelu. This is a special process that legally, uh, that legally needs to be taken in Finland in some case of a temporary layoff and, uh, or dismissal, in case of uh, temporary layoff and dismissal. Some research institutes have uh, predicted that uh, our economy might shrink uh, uh, between three and six percent this year uh, but uh, I guess it's too early to make any any definite predictions on that yet. The government will naturally try to minimize damage by taking different measures. It has introduced the first supplementary budget to support the companies. The, this budget is worth about 400 million euros and includes, for example, supplementary unemployment benefits for entrepreneurs. Companies financing will be secured through a number of uh, billion euro measures. A new, new direct payments will also be introduced. The purpose of these measures is to ensure the liquidity of companies during the crisis and to prevent bankruptcies. Uh, the measures will be in place in all sectors. Altogether, the government currently estimates that the total value of this and, uh, and the upcoming support measures might be around uh, uh, 15 billion euros. Uh, the direct funding uh, to the companies is channeled through Business Finland, Finvera and ELU centers. ELU centers meaning the Centers for Economic Development, Transport and the Environment. Business Finland uh, has already received thousands of uh, funding applications 
from uh, small and medium-sized enterprises and mid-cap-sized mid enterprises. As you well probably know, Finland is, is still a very export-driven economy, and almost 40% of our GDP comes from exports. The fast recovery of our important trade partners is therefore crucial to us. We hope that the situation also in China keeps getting better and that we are able to develop and deepen our bilateral trade relations even further in the future. But I, I think now time is up and it's time for me to finish now. So once again, thanks you, thank you very much for joining and um, I'm happy to take any, any questions you might have then later and uh, you can type them in, in the chat. chat. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, and, and I can see that we have already received a few questions, so thank you for those, and, and uh, as mentioned, we will get back to those at the uh, Q&A session at the end of this webinar. But next up, uh, Business Finland uh, Trade Commissioner Grace Wan, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, until now, um, Business Finland, we have conducted two separate surveys on the impact of coronavirus on our customers. The second survey has been focused on companies that have used our services before. When we comparing with results from the survey conducted a month ago, it is clear that the situation has developed significantly for the worse. Uh, in February, the crisis caused massive disruption in Asia, directed at uh, production and Chinese travel and consumption it is now caused a worldwide economic standstill. The second survey was done between March 19th and 26th. The online questionnaire, which was pretty much similar as the one at the beginning of February, was sent to approximately 3,000 company individuals. We have received a total of 656 uh, uh, respondents. In February, we got 299 responses. Um, this time from the survey, more than 80% of the respondents uh, represented uh, SMEs or micro businesses and less than 20% represented uh, large corporations or mid caps. The three biggest primary industrial classifications among the respondents were manufacturing, which is uh, 39%, information and communication, which is 23%, and professional scientific and technical activities, which is uh, 7%. You can see from here that uh, the company's assessments on the effects of the pandemic on their turnover have become significantly more pessimistic over the past month. At the beginning of February, if you still remember that, a half of the respondents to our survey expected the impact on their turnover would be very small. But now in March, 84% expected effects to be negative or very negative. The epidemic is now impacting on all market areas, when in February, the clearest impacts were seen only in Asia. In March survey, slightly more severe impacts were also indicated for businesses that operate in Africa, the Middle East, or South America than for other areas. This is likely to be due to the restrictions on international trade and logistic problems caused by the outbreak. Even though these areas are not yet as severely affected by the epidemic as, for example, Asia, Europe, and North America. The percentage of the respondents uh, who expect to encounter new restrictions on international trade has risen from 28% in February to 65% percent in March. The situation has deteriorated in respect of uh, shortages in supplies and components. Uh, we can see that 43 percent of the respondents agreed or strongly agreed with this statement when the figure was only 23 percent in February. The percentage of respondents who foresee logistic problems have risen from 26 percent in February to 58 percent in March. A uh, majority, which is uh, close to 80% of our respondents this time, expect the outbreak to reduce the number of orders they're getting, uh, when less than 20% in February had the same uh, view. So this has largely changed. 
and close to 70% of the respondents this time estimated that the outbreak is likely to slow down or shut down productions and approximately 80% expect the outbreak to damage their organizational financial positions. So the situation is very much, as you can see here, getting uh, very worse. Um, an even more dramatic change can be seen uh, in the respondents' estimates of the impact on employee numbers. In February, approximately 80% of the respondents estimated that there would not be any impact or very little impact uh, on the employee numbers. But now in March, almost 60% of the respondents estimated the impacts to be negative or very negative. Very sorry, Grace, to interrupt, but I think uh, there, uh, there was some uh, technical problem and we lost our right slide. So could you tell us which slide to use now? This is okay. This is okay. Yeah, thank you. So let's continue. Uh, companies, uh, as um, our ambassador just now mentioned, that uh, a Finnish government has taken uh, very active measures to support the companies. At the same time that our companies have been taking also actively different measures to mitigate the impact at this moment. Of the companies that responded to our survey, two-thirds are looking for extra funding to secure their operations and almost half of the respondents have furloughed or are planning to furlough their employees. So besides these normal measures that the companies are taking, uh, the other actions that companies mention include salary flexibility agreed with their employees, cutting back on costs of premises or other costs, focusing on product development. This is very good because uh, this is very important for the near future when the corona situation is getting better. And also significant changes in business models, moving operation online, redundancies, or even close their businesses completely. For the travel industry, uh, there is a separate survey conducted by Visit Finland some time ago. And we received a total of 418 travel industry respondents. The result shows that 46% uh, of the Finnish travel companies had significant losses in the first quarter. By the second quarter, 86% of the travel industry companies in Finland will be severely impacted to have losses. Companies also felt that uh, deferred product development not loan payments, longer payment times, and business uh, Finland new funding in disruptive circumstances, uh, these are all very important tools for them to uh, beat the crisis at this moment. Uh, the attention of many companies is now on surviving the acute crisis. We, Business Finland, helped companies to get over the worst. For instance, the funding for disruptive uh, circumstances instrument. At this moment, we have received a total number of uh, funding applications, uh, soon close to 20,000. And we are allocating all possible resources uh, to speed up the process uh, for approval. So if you want to have more details, please uh, visit our web page and also free, feel free to contact us at any time. We want to emphasize that preparation for the time after coronavirus must be started now. So Business Finland has its eyes and ears open around the globe. We are already offering uh, companies uh, information on opportunities around the world. We will make these insights and signals available on our online services, for instance, uh, on the Team Finland Market Opportunities. So if you want to see some new business uh, opportunities emerging uh, from around the globe right now, please also visit our web pages for more detailed information or contact our people at any time. Um, Let's stay together mentally, not physically, even though uh, beat the crisis uh, together and we wish all safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grace.
And uh, next, uh, we'll move on to the banking sector with uh, Peter Lynn uh, Vanneros, please. Well, thank you very much, and thank you very much for this opportunity to participate in this interesting uh, webinar. Uh, so, just uh, so the road to recovery, uh, it's clear that uh, China is on the road to recovery as opposed to the rest of the world. The question is how far we have come uh, in this path. And apart from working from SCB and SCB uh, in China, uh, Greater China, we have stayed open here in Beijing and in Shanghai and in Hong Kong with all our sites operating and processing business as normal. And I'm also chair of the European Banking Group within the European Chamber here, so I'm in constant touch with the 60 European banks present in China. So. So I'll talk about a bit about the peak passing, um, and then in terms of the virus, the economic effects, what are the measures for the recovery and the support that the government is providing in China, the banking system, and if I have time also, the effects on the US-China trade agreement, which seems that what was a long time ago, it's not, but of, of course that is also affected by the economic crisis. So, well, growth obviously heavily reduced in, in the first quarter, not only because of the blockage of the supply, no industry working, but of course also demand, and I'm talking first about demand in China, but also the drop in investment. So I'll talk a bit about that. The support that I mentioned, and of course, and the risks to implementation of the agreement because of the slower demand and slow growth in China. Well, this is a graph that we've seen and everybody looks at the number of new cases every day. And of course, it's key to the confidence in the Chinese economy. And I think that is also <clears throat> something that might be encouraging for, for Europe and for the States if we can follow a similar path. And uh, just looking at Beijing, we have either zero cases or two or three new cases every day. So that is, of course, encouraging. And it also means that the economy can return to its uh, normal path again, although it's going to take a long time. Of course, the highest drop, and if you can, it's very difficult to, to measure this, and uh, Goldman Sachs said 9%, some uh, analysts have said 12%, some say 6 some say 4 What we really have to focus on is that it was a, a, an enormous drop. Uh, with an economy standing at almost standstill, and I'll get into some more details about that. I think the actual number is not so important, and we will get that in April now, the, the exact number that the Chinese government will provide. And of course, uh, another huge drop is in, in the purchasing manager index. And as you all know, any number be between uh, lower than 50 is a negative uh, view compared to the previous month. And now we saw a drop down to 30, depending on which index, if you focus on, on the large companies or if you focus more on the smaller companies, they've all been uh, enormous drops to uh, around 30%, some 32, some 34. And now we saw also a rebound to levels above 50, but as we should not have looked too closely at the drop, when the economy was at standstill, we cannot take too much comfort in the increase. This means that it's more favorable than it was the previous month, and that's, of course, something we can take comfort in, but it doesn't mean that we're back at a normal level. Several indicators are pointing upwards. The one furthest to the right is, uh, I think, so. the text has disappeared, or it's very white. That's uh, visitors to movie theaters. <laughs> and um, if you're not in the movie business, some uh, theaters opened this last week. Uh, but now closed again. And I was talking to one bank which is focused in uh, leasing uh, the machinery, the projectors, to the movie theaters. Obviously, they're in big trouble. But then we look at indexes such as uh, traffic congestion, pollution, <coughs> number of containers shipped, and everything is now moving back. And all these indi indices taken together, of course, mean that we see an economy that is now recovering and uh, getting back to its growth path, although there's uh, some distance to go. Grocery, online grocery sales, that is an industry that you should be in. You, we can see uh, strongly upwards going. If we look at some of the suppliers, Alibaba, Ding Dong, Is Fresh, JD, they're all showing uh, 
strongly upward trends. That's quite logical. That's what people have been doing. They've been do quarantining at home and ordering their food stuff. So there are obviously some sectors that have seen improved sales during the last few months, but those are obviously the exception to the rule. Another positive effect, I'm sure some of you have seen, seen that. So the middle slide, which is in the middle of the crisis, is our pollution levels in China, taken from satellite pictures. And what is encouraging from an economic viewpoint is that uh, on the slide further to the right, we see increasing pollution levels again. And that, of course, means that the machineries are again turning. We see increased production levels in the coal powered fire plants. Uh, steel mills actually have been producing almost at full capacity throughout the crisis. It's very expensive to, to uh, turn off a steel mill production. So, actually, in a few sectors, we have seen hardly any reduction in production levels at all. And steel is one of those. So, that type of pollution has remained. But otherwise, we're not quite back at the pollution levels on the slide to the far left, but uh, we're getting close. So here we can see the big gap. Uh, the gray line on top of this slide is normal levels in 2019, and the red line is 2020. And we can clearly see the drop, which is normal in terms of Chinese New Year. That was, of course, the lucky part that uh, the uh, epidemic started at the same time we would normally see a slowdown in in China, and I was just before coming here meeting with a, a real estate company, and they always have the two worst months uh, in the beginning of the year. So this was not so exceptional. Construction slowed down. So many, uh, but the pickup that we normally see in February after Chinese New Year, of course, didn't happen. We saw continued slowdown, but still levels improving through March. Of course, it will be difficult to do the last part as well. Looking at another sector, which is of course very important, not only for China, but for the world, the Chinese car market is equal to the size of the US car market, the European car market, and the Japanese car market taken together. And the Chinese market is still bigger. We saw a drop of 90% of car sales from normal levels in February, and also in the beginning of March. But I was talking yesterday to the factory manager of Daimler's biggest car factory in the world, it's located here outside of Beijing. They are now operating 24 seven and they cannot produce enough Mercedes cars for the sales that which are picking up, up now for the last two weeks, which is uh, for me as a European a mystery with taking into consideration all the uncertainties remaining in the Chinese economy, but it's still uh, very encouraging to see. So the car market is also uh, recovering. The one problem they have is, of course, some of the supplies come from Europe. Uh, most is produced in China, but some key components are coming from Europe. And of course, our European factories are now at a standstill. So in a couple of weeks, that's going to be a problem for Chinese car production. Consumption travel, uh, we already heard from the survey from uh, Finland regarding the travel business. Obviously, it's been completely devastated here in China, uh, where traffic has declined by uh, 70%. Uh, I spoke about property already. The banking sector, when we talk uh, between the European banks, we see that payment levels now are at 75% of normal level. <clears throat> and trade transactions, meaning letters of credit, foreign payments are at 50%. At and that's, of course, now due mainly to lack of demand in Europe. Previously, it was lack of production in, in China. Where, so we see a recovery from 25% of payment levels uh, one uh, uh, month ago and now back. Phone industry has, has not seen such a huge drop. So that's similar to the steel industry with uh, levels staying uh, more or less normal. And then the indexes. If we take all these uh, different parts together, we see that we are moving quickly back into levels close to 80%. Uh, both if you look at the SME index, uh, something called the premium uh, consultancy, also moving, if you, you just compare between March 27 to April 1st, it's an improvement of uh, 3%, which is uh, quite fast in a few days. Uh, the problem is that the last recovery from 80 to 100 is probably going to be uh, the most difficult part. 
So here the same thing, looking at traffic congestion, we see that the Shanghai Metro is now at 90% of capacity, of, uh, or close to full capacity, which is also a good sign. And the same thing when we look at power, uh, consumption of power production in the, in the major power plants. Stimulus package. The government is putting a lot of money, uh, although uh, not as much as the international analysts had expected. Uh, they're still uh, aware of the uh, indebtedness of China and they don't want to uh, put the same uh, level of stimulus that they did in the, in the uh, 2008 crisis. Lending facilitation through the banking system, 1 trillion RMB, and also cuts to the required reserve requirements, meaning that banks can leverage, leverage their balance sheet more, uh, tax and fee cuts, 500 billion, and of course infrastructure, uh, which uh, not so far so much announced, but uh, expectation of one trillion in infrastructure spending. And that is enabled by uh, allowing the cities and provinces to issue uh, bonds to a much greater extent than before, which is the way they will finance infrastructure. Uh, also SME financing, and the problem is, of course, reaching the SMEs who often are not relying on bank financing and they need to have other channels. So they're providing rental guarantees uh, and other types of support and also liquidity injection. So there's a lot of liquidity in the system right now. Of course, uh, some provinces are providing e-vouchers uh, and we also see uh, retail companies providing coupons. And then the question is, the new growth targets uh, for the Chinese economy, will they drive the stimulus? or should uh, the stimulus decide uh, how much growth there is. Our own estimates within SEB, we look at 4% growth, 3.5% three, to 4% for the whole year. And when I talk to many of our clients, they are confident that they will be able to reach almost their budgets for China for, for this year, depending on the sector where they're in. Banks, these are international banks, and we can look at the equity ratios. And I, no need to spend that, but you can see that the dark line uh, is the situation in end of 2019, which is of course much, much stronger than in, it was in 2007. So the banking system globally is able to support this much more. And this is also valid for the largest Chinese banks. If we talk about the smaller and medium sized banks, then we are in a lot more difficulties. And this had already started before the virus. And that's uh, where there are definitely weaknesses uh, within the system. Well, just a trade deal, uh, we don't need to go through that, but of course there are now problems to be able to uh, do all the purchases that China has promised to do from the, from the US. Demand is going to be weaker this year, and there's also a big problem in terms of the oil price where we see prices near $20, and a large part of the uh, purchases that China has promised to do with the US are in the energy sector, and they, the volumes are never going to be generate the amount of money that uh, China has now promised to acquire from the US. So that is going to be another point that is going to be a point of contention between the US uh, and China, apart from the long list of other points of contention that we already have. So that's something to bear in mind when we look at the US-China relation and the ability to comply with the trade deal. On a positive note, we can see that uh, two days ago, another part of the banking sector was open so two American banks got approvals to uh, open asset management uh, companies in China, and we hope that some European banks will take advantage of that uh, in, in the near future. So to summarize, I know, I know I've spent uh, my allotted time. Um, we are cautiously optimistic, and when I talk to many of our Nordic clients and German clients, uh, they are close to... Um, almost fully back to the level of production they had. But of course, with a big question mark for the very important export sector, uh, where there's close to no demand, and then the Chinese government will have to provide support to companies. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Peter, for this very informative package. And next, next up, um, we, <clears throat> we open the microphones to Finland. So, Harri, can you hear us? <clears throat> yes, hearing loud and clear. Can you hear me? Perfect. So, please, Harri, go on. All right. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm Harri 
Roberto from uh, Green Stream Net. Thanks for having me here. I have just a few slides on Green Stream to give you a context on, on uh, who we are and, and that hopefully gives a context on sort of the feedback we are, we are getting from the Chinese market. So um, next uh, slide, please. <clears throat> so um, we are a Finnish company with subsidiaries in China. And what we do is that we develop and finance energy efficiency projects within Chinese industry. And also we provide advisory uh, fund management and investment services in the carbon, i.e. emissions trading and, and renewable energy markets. Next slide, please. Um, through our energy efficiency projects, um, we are, from Finnish perspective, exporting uh, Finnish clean technologies into China, or from Chinese perspective, importing them. Um, and uh, through our energy efficiency projects, we have opened the Chinese markets for a few Finnish SMEs and are working with, with several using their technologies in our projects and are all the time looking for new technology partners. So we work with Finnish, typically SMEs, also bigger, bigger, bigger companies and uh, use their technologies in our projects in, in China. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is just a uh, sort of picture to tell you what is a what is an EMC project. So um, we go into the factory, we make an investment, we bring in new technology, we improve something there. As a result, the client uses, for example, less power, electricity, or less coal, or less heat, and other um, other things such as water and, and, and so on. Also typically they have lower maintenance costs than the client pays from the uh, achieved savings uh, part to us and gives keeps part of part of it themselves. Uh, so this is what we do. We finance and develop these projects and for a client, it's like a win-win situation. They don't have to invest and, and they start to earn from day one. And from the Finnish technology company perspective, it's also a great, um, great model. We are the client, and this especially helps when when there are sort of new to, new to the market technologies. All right, next slide, please. Um, okay, now we're getting to to the point of today. So so at the moment, our clients are pulp and paper mills, steel mills, and power plants. Uh, and and the feedback. I'll tell you is, is basically from these, these sectors. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, altogether, we have over 200 projects in China. Majority of them are related to emission reductions and emissions trading markets. So we do have a wider uh, client base than, than just our energy efficiency projects, which are about 15, 15 projects uh, at the moment. So we have a pretty good spread sort of uh, around China. Uh, and and uh, uh, hopefully I can, I can shed some light on, you know, what the situation looks like from our perspective and, how, and some of our clients' perspective. Next slide, please. All right, so. This is the virus we are all, all fighting and, and that is causing all the havoc. Uh, Finnish installation version of it. So uh, yeah, next, next slide, please. Uh, as, as, as the previous speaker told, the industry is, is on its way back to fully normal uh, operation, but it's not in full capacity at least from our perspective perspective yet um, talking to to our team uh, on the front line in china for the paper industry there's sort of a non-scientific estimate was that maybe it's like six, 60 percent capacities is being used um, 
on the steel sector, yeah, it's true that that the big mills, of course, have not been shut down, but we are not seeing hundred percent capacity being used either. So, so also they are not not uh, the few that are our our clients anyway. They are not in in hundred percent uh, operation, uh, and then there are complications uh, i saw that someone asked about about fusion so at least to us one of our clients actually also in 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 fusion uh, so if our chinese uh, experts would go visit the client our experts would, would need to stay 14 days in a quarantine basically before going to the mill uh, which makes it impossible to visit such a client whereas some other clients we can already visit in, in, in china with no quarantine issues either going to the client's mill or coming back to beijing where our our main offices are so it's sort of a it's, uh, depends um, promise to promise at, at the moment uh, next slide please Uh, next slide, yeah. So then, um, obviously, the whole world has seen a huge increase in online conferencing calls, working tools such as just as Zoom that we are now using here, um, and uh, that has happened at least from our perspective to some extent also in in China or maybe even to a large extent. But as we work with pretty traditional industries so what we've been able to see is that yes there is more uh, more usage of online communication tools and, and online working within the bigger groups between their headquarters and 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 their mills for reporting type of issues but at least we <laughs> Uh, for, from our perspective, this isn't a solution for, you know, negotiating on a new project with, with the client. Um, for us, from our perspective, and of course that then goes also to our, our uh, technology company partners. So every client or potential client in China is just postponing at the moment. Uh, you know, sales negotiations meetings to plan new projects. Uh, here, however, it's um, important to remember that that we are selling, let's say, non-critical improvement investments. In 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 what I mean with that, non-critical is that the client can continue to produce paper or steel or power without doing a project with us so and I, i'm sure you know critical parts are being purchased as before because you need to run the paper mill if something breaks down you need to replace it but but we are selling sort of improvements above status quo and, and that's something you can always postpone more easily and that's definitely what we are seeing all new sales negotiations are totally frozen at the moment and and uh, slide please and then uh, I tried to list here sort of what we see as the biggest problem some of them I already mentioned on the sales side but then there's an additional part uh, when will it be possible to get Finnish or any uh, non-Chinese I mean coming from from outside of China experts on site for critical missions such as for commissioning of, of, of new pro uh, we seem to have lost Harik. Harik, can you hear us? Can anyone hear us? Do you hear it any better now? Yes, yes, I can hear it in Paulo. Yes, okay. 
Okay, yeah, I, I don't know what was the problem. Sorry for that. Uh, so um, we, we we signed a deal quite quite recently. It was closed just before the Corona havoc started. But uh, now the delivery uh, delivery of the of the hardware um, is is in a few weeks, and uh, uh, we have a huge problem that that. <laughs> We don't know, and no one knows, of course. When would it be realistic to assume that that we could have a team of Finnish experts flying to China, getting on site uh, for the for the commissioning? And here, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but but I, I know that legal departments of of many companies and and, and law firms are scrutinizing force majeure clauses a lot, and I would. I would encourage everyone to do that when you enter into new contracts, and of course, also when you, if you have problems with existing existing deals, it's very typical for force majeure clauses in contracts to 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 have text such as if the issue couldn't be reasonably forecasted to happen. And now that right, it would be pretty easy to argue that, for example, a problem of getting Finnish experts on site that, you know, it is, it is a problem that was easy to see to, to, to happen. So, so uh, be, be careful there, there with the contrast. But anyway, this is a, this is a huge problem potentially for some companies and at least it is for us. And then as I said, all of the clients are postponing non-critical investments at the moment which makes makes very very difficult to close close new deals uh for outside the slide uh, as our our energy efficiency clients are basically paying us monthly for the savings so we haven't seen a huge uh delaying payments at least until now from chinese clients which is surprisingly positive for me but that isn't new sales either yeah. Uh, so um, someone can correct me if I have the wrong date here, but I believe there's a People's uh, Congress uh, meeting in a couple of weeks, uh, and as has been mentioned by previous speakers, so so China has a huge push to get interest in the economy back on track, hundred percent, and. Uh, uh, probably will get there soon. Uh, however, the lagging foreign demand for, for from Chinese perspective for their export industries is, is a huge question mark and something domestic measures in China cannot uh, make up for uh, fully, no matter what, what they do. And this of course will constantly affect also our, let's say, technology sales to China um, because the, the, our, our, any of our clients are from the export industry. So, so they are, they are uh, going to be affected for, for uh, many months at minimum, I would say. So um, yeah, this was basically, basically my snapshot from uh, Finnish SME's perspective active on the Chinese Chinese markets and uh, yeah happy to take any questions on the Q&A thank you thank you Harian and Harian please do stay on the line um, it seems that we have gotten quite many questions so um, hopefully hopefully everyone can can stay on the line if we go a bit over over the scheduled time but now I now I give the floor to uh, Jaakko Koivusaari Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your excellent questions. Maybe we can start with Ambassador. Um, we have a couple of short questions for you. So the first one is, hello, my GM needs to go to factory in Fushun to take leave there. He's now in Helsinki. What are the possible ways? He has been in Finland from beginning of February. Can Embassy give any help? Well, uh, this is a typical question we get nowadays. and. Uh, and um, as we heard from Harry as well, so um, uh, traveling to China and, and also in China is very difficult nowadays. 
and it depends where, where you're going and what you want to do. So I, I presume that your GM is a, a Chinese citizen, and uh, in that case, of course, he can he can return to China, but then uh, uh, what, what uh, he has to face are the uh, uh, quarantine uh, restrictions, at least. And um, so, as I said, so this situation is, is quite fluid, keeps changing all the time, and and, um, and you ask that can embassy give any help? So yes, I hope, uh, but uh, you should first, I think, ask Chinese embassy in Helsinki so they can give you a more accurate picture, and it's it's more in in, in their responsibility. Uh, thank you. And the second question is. Uh about the cargo flights. So someone asked, can Finnair fly the cargo flights also only once per week? Um, this re uh, restriction, what I was talking about, so um, that uh, goes only for the uh, passenger traffic. So, um, so far there's been no uh, restrictions to my knowledge at least on, on cargo, so that uh, there can be several flights a, a week. Okay, so maybe we'll uh, take the next question to Mr. Ling Van Rus. So uh, someone asked on chat, uh, will the measures listed be enough to support the positive growth of three to four percent this year? Economists in Finland estimate the negative growth of GDP for China for the whole year. Um, well, we think that there will be further um, support measures announced uh, in mid-April. Uh, of course, the big drawback <clears throat> or the big problem is, of course, uh, the the uh, lack of export possibilities that have all been mentioned several times. Uh, but we believe that the uh, support measures and the uh, improvement in Chinese consumption eventually coming uh, will uh, be able to generate a positive growth number for China, whether it's going to be three, four, or two, but it's, uh, uh, we don't believe that there will be negative growth. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador, you wanted to add something still to the question regarding the GM who, who needs to go to Fushun. Yeah, we received more information over, about on the GM. So, um, uh, yeah, and he he seems to be a Finnish um, citizen. So, in, in, as I said earlier, so there are uh, some exceptions are possible. I mean, in in uh, in principle now, so the uh, borders are closed for foreigners, but uh, also this could be one of the reasons to grant that kind of an exception and. Uh, and even more now, you should uh, talk to the Chinese embassy in in, in Finland and uh, their rules and, and and apply for for a possible ex uh, exception. Okay. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, maybe still another West question to Mr. Ling Van Nerus. So, uh, how significant impacts will the drop of the demand in other countries cause for the Chinese economy? Do you have an estimation of? Well, as as was already mentioned, uh, twenty percent of the Chinese GDP uh, is consists of exports. So obviously it's significant. There are some markets that will be less affected uh, uh, than others. And of course, there are also, I mean, we all see about uh, medical exports and uh, China is trying to, uh, to promote that. So there will be some compensation there. Uh, but we believe that uh, the government stimulus will be able to, to compensate for, for part of the, of the reduction in exports. Okay, thank you very much. So Harry, uh, if you can hear me, we have a we have a question for you. Uh, so sure. there was a comment on the chat uh, or a question. So basically, no real production operation, right? Mm, yeah, I saw the question. Uh, hi, Harry. I'm not entirely sure what that means. If that means our our uh, clients, so yes, they are back to operation. Some of them were never never shut down so but if that means what Greenstream does so so um, we our projects are such that they uh, make the Chinese clients plant more energy efficient so uh, we don't build whole plants we just make improvements to existing plants but I'm not sorry I don't understand the question fully Oh, okay, thank, thank you. Uh, actually, there's another question. You mentioned uh, the amount of video conferences has, has gone up a lot. So there was a more general question about uh, how, how you see the way of working uh, will remain different after time of uh, working remotely. Do you have some views on this? Well, I, I really hope that, that uh, it will uh, prevent some, let's say, unnecessary 
traveling that we all all uh not just in china but i was also uh sort of uh learn even better new ways of of working than 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 we do now but having said that as, as i said unfortunately I, i was more hopeful that our chinese clients uh you know that we could do the sales things online easily but um uh, with the, let's say mill level people on the ground on the on the paper still mill sites for example so that hasn't really happened you know and i don't see it's gonna gonna happen so yes there will be some sustainable change for sure but not uh, not a revolution from our perspective okay thank you very much maybe next uh, i could ask one question from business business finland uh, so grace um, uh, there's a question about the company funding so so how much funding can actually one company get and, and what's the usual amount of funding per company uh, right now, we have two types of funding for the companies at this uh, uh, challenging situation. The first one uh, with the amount of 10,000 euro and 80% uh, can be grants. And the second is um, up to 100,000 euro with the same 80% as grants. Okay, thank you, Grace. And the next question is maybe to Ambassador or, or to Business Finland as well. So uh, there's a question, how do you see Finnish company uh, de-invest from China? Uh, do our business not have any concrete steps or measures to help or support this? These are, of course, I mean, these are business decisions and um, I, I think every company's situation is a very, a very different. But uh, in practical terms, I don't know if you, Grace, if you can say something about the business Finland's role. Um, as mentioned already that uh, the funding is uh, one of the important tools that uh, uh, most of the Finnish SMEs uh, are seeking uh, actively for, from uh, Finnish government support and as well from Business Finland. At the same time, as I mentioned that uh, uh, Business Finland and together with the Team Finland uh, partners, uh, we are in full function, especially in China. So uh, we are actively looking for um, alternative business opportunities that has uh, arisen from this uh, challenging situation. And uh, we're also setting up uh, uh, project teams uh, to help uh, different industry sectors of companies uh, to move forward together with the local government authorities. But I can also add that there's no measures now prohibiting the transfer. So if somebody wants to sell the company or de-invest from China, uh, from, a, from the banking view, we don't see any obstacles. Of course, it's a long process and it takes a long time, often more than a year, uh, even in the best of times, to, to be able to uh, close down a company and transfer the equity. But there are no measures uh, prohibiting that or slowing it down more than it, it usually does. Thank you, Mr. Ling. I could still ask one question from you. It's about stimulus, which you mentioned earlier. So, so we, I guess we can expect significant financial stimulus from Chinese government. So how large risk is the growing amount of debt for China, uh, Chinese economy and even the global economy? Of course, I mean, the, the Chinese economy is heavily indebted, and which is, is bad. And it, it, of course, it's a burden for future generations. And we also know that uh, China is the first middle income country that is, uh, has a very aging population. But in short term, uh, uh, the, what the good thing is that the debt is mainly domestic. There's hardly any foreign debt, which means there's not really any limits to how much uh, debt the Chinese government take on. It's uh, it's placed uh, within the uh, in China, and the Chinese population is still in a savings mode. So the very large savings here. So it's, so short term, uh, there's no problem with uh, the increase of debt, and that's of course something that the Chinese government is carefully considering, and that's also the reason why they have not launched. Uh, to completely full bazooka, as they say, yet. But um, the indebtedness uh, short term is not a problem. Great, thank you. And one final question uh, is to Harry Roto. Uh, so this is about environment. Uh, as the COVID-19 hits the economy hard, is there a risk that China deprioritizes its emission or climate targets when it focuses more on getting economy back on track? Um, yeah, hi. Uh, good, good question. Uh, certainly, there is a risk, but I just uh, had a long discussion with our, our Chinese CEO yesterday. Um, 
I mean, he's, he's pretty well well connected on, on different levels in China. Um, and uh, he he was of the opinion that the upcoming People's Congress will actually send a strong message that the environment must continue to be prioritized, and there will be also uh, sort of targeted subsidy measures for environmentally friendly environmental protection uh, uh, projects. Uh, um, so, so, uh, or well, the project is right word or not, but anyway, so, so his expectation was that actually it will not be deprioritized, uh, that, that the, the push, push will be strong to, to keep environment, uh, emission cuts, uh, strongly on the agenda. What is then the reality? What, what happens? Let's, let's see, but, but this was at least the, the view I got. Okay, thank you very much. That's about the Q&A session. Uh, great questions, thank you. All right, thank you. I think we have gone one minute over our, our scheduled time, uh, but um, thank you once again for all of our all of our speakers here in Beijing and Harari, you in, in Finland. And uh, well, it's, uh, oh, and one more thing. We will again be putting um, the recording of this um, this webinar in different channels in um, today or, or during the weekend and send, send it to all participants, of course.